Muy bien. La, la última charla que di en castellano uh, fue en, uh, en, uh, en Toledo. Me había invitado a Drazá a dar una charla de, de historia de ciencias. Y hablé de, de, este, de este científico del, uh, del, del décimo siglo, Ibn al Haysam, que, es, que era una persona que trabajó en el campo de la óptica. Y a través de la óptica es el que empezó la, el método experimental. Entonces, el método experimental nació de la óptica y, y es muy gracioso de ver que, bueno, por ejemplo, las leyes de refracción y cosas así ya estaban contenidas en, en su libro, eh, la cual eh, eh, traducción es dada aquí. Después su libro pasó en Europa y, y es interesante que son los curas, la iglesia, que estaban más interesadas en, en entender la, natura, la naturaleza de la luz porque eh, querían entender también la naturaleza de la luz espiritual. Entonces son ellos que abrieron la puerta, Roger Bacon y, uh, uh, ¿cómo se llama? Roger, uh, el otro, sí, Grostest y, y también en, uh, Vitello en, en, en Polonia. Los tres eran curas. Uh, igual, su libro siguió, la última versión fue uh, publicada seis uh, siglos después de, 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 de su muerte, pero es, eh, es la base de lo que dio entonces el Novum Organum de, 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 um, de Roger Bacon y eh, también el discurso de la méthode de, de Descartes. Ok, ahí eh, paro con, con el castellano, creo que es mejor pasar al inglés porque voy a ser más técnico y voy a hablar de luz, claro, pero de luz de longitudes de onda eh, un poco particulares. Y después, si quieren hacer las preguntas en castellano, ningún problema, estoy uh, perfectamente dispuesto. Entonces, empiezo siempre... Uh, oh, sorry, okay, now I switch to English, yes. <laughs> I, I, I often uh, speak about these uh, new techniques uh, by citing this famous saying by Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of the double helix DNA structure. If you want to understand function, study structure. And you have many methods now that have been developed over the years over the last century, X-ray crystallography, electron microscopy, atomic force microscopy, and so on, that allow you to get static structures. However, reality is not static. And this is um, a simulation by the late <coughs> Klaus Schulten, uh, showing the passage of the transport of water through an aquaporin channel in a cell membrane. And what you want is to see things in motion. In fact, this is an old problem in science. It's, it did not start uh, with, with the, the birth of structural dynamics. Oh, yeah, sorry. So I would, uh, I would without being too pretentious, I would add time-dependent structure in this uh, saying. Okay, uh, so this is an old problem. And uh, the problem of capturing objects in motion or uh, whatever uh, dates back to the end of the 19th century. Etienne Jules Marais should be, uh, you know, should receive more recognition because he's really the inventor of the shutter camera which gave birth to cinema, cinematography. Uh, and he, uh, he was actually, he was not interested in just developing movie pictures. He was a physiologist and an anatomist and he was interested in animal motion. And so he developed the shutter camera which he called the physi photographique. So he was, uh, probably that's where the expression to shoot a film comes from, I'm not sure. But anyway, he used uh, this uh, device and then he improved it and he uh, was interested therefore, as I said, by uh, animal motion. But then later in his career, he started looking at uh, fluid flow also through um, you know, different uh, uh, cavities. Uh, but let's go back to animal motion. I like the cat, I like cats actually, and I like the, the, the fall of the cat because this is something I was teaching medis medicine, uh, physics to medical students for 13 years, and this is an example of conservation of angular momentum that I used to give to the students. And if you, if you release a cat, pause up, uh, you will see it undergoes a first isomerization and then a double isomerization, and then it recovers the initial symmetry and gets to the ground, and there it, it goes, uh, you know, it relaxes. So <coughs> this picture initially was taken with millisecond time resolution, and If you take the size of a cat, which is about 30 nanometers, now scale down 30 nanometers to the size of a chemical bond, let's say about three angstroms, then you will see that you reach the range of picoseconds to hundreds of femtoseconds. So basically, 
you know, time scales at the level of chemical bonds are very fast simply because chemical bonds are very small. Now, you don't always need to go to femtoseconds or whatever uh, to study uh, nature. It depends what you are interested in. As I said, animal motion would be milliseconds. The, the breathing, the uh, uh, transition from the relaxed to the tense transition of um, hemoglobin would take microseconds. <coughs> Fluorescence, for example, takes nanoseconds. Um, rotation of molecules or molecular librations, phonons in solids would take like picoseconds. Isomerization of retinol, for example, that we have in our eye, whenever a photon impinges on retinol, you have an isomerization that takes about 200 femtoseconds. So now we start getting into the motion of, uh, uh, you know, uh, atomic assemblies in, in real time. And if you look at the vibration of the H2O molecule, this is about 10 femtoseconds. So you see, if you want to see nuclei uh, in motion, then you have to go uh, into this range. Now you can go further down and you can go into the attosecond time domain and there you are looking at electron motion because electrons are of course a lot lighter than uh, nuclei. And to, to reach these uh, ranges, it took uh, many years after the Second World War uh, was the birth of flash photolysis. Uh, by George Porter and then the T-jump method or the relaxation method by, by Manfred Eigen. Uh, Porter and Norrish worked together and they got the Nobel Prize for time resolving chemical reactions in 1967. Uh, but then we, we were still not at the, uh, in the time scale of nuclear motion. You had to wait for the birth of the lasers and then lasers immediately after their birth moved into the pulsed mode, nanosecond, picosecond and then around the early 1980s um, into the femtosecond time domain and that's where Ahmed Zawail did his great contributions by looking at uh, chemical reactions in real time or molecular motion in real time. Uh, now you can go, as I said, into the attosecond time domain by a, by, a, by a method called high harmonic generation. I'm not going to describe it too much in detail. Uh, but it allows you to go into the attosecond time domain. The only thing is that you on, it only provides um, uh, photons in the uh, X-ray uh, vacuum ultraviolet range. Okay, so the basic method to probe matter is to uh, first excite the sample with the first pulse and then after a given time delay, probe it with a second pulse. And the uh, delay between the pump and the probe is adjusted by optical delay lines because there is no electronics going into the femtosecond, let alone I mean, even in the, into the picosecond time domain. So if you have optical delay lines, you can shift by 10 femtoseconds if you move the mirrors by 3 microns. And this is what Ahmed Zawail used when he did his first revolution. I like that you use the word revolution, where he observed uh, uh, for the first time uh, the photo dissociation of the ICN molecule. So the molecule sliding down a repulsive potential and breaking into I plus CN. Uh, he excited the system here and then he probed it at different wavelengths to follow the dynamics. Uh, and then he, uh, he also observed the oscillation of molecules in the case of NAI. And this oscillation is damped because of a leakage of population to a uh, dissociative channel. And this earned him the Nobel Prize in 1999. So uh, in, in our lab we have developed different tools, both in the visible UV and and uh, short wavelengths domain. Uh, we have, uh, as I said, so visible uh, all the way to the red uh, transient absorption. We can do fluorescence studies with femtosecond resolution. Uh, but the, the main tool I will describe here is picosecond and, and femtosecond X-ray spectroscopy. Uh, we also do X-ray emission. And we have recently implemented multidimensional transient uh, um, absorption uh, deep UV spectroscopies. Pushing these methods into the X-ray domain is one of the major goals uh, at present. And we also have uh, the capability to do photoelectron spectroscopy. So these, these three uh, are part of the family of core level spectroscopies. But I will mainly focus on X-ray absorption due to time. And the type of uh, systems we investigate are quite varied. We, can, we look at uh, molecular systems, uh, at uh, proteins, uh, at materials and especially uh, materials of interest for solar energy research and also at uh, 
more fundamental phenomena like solvation dynamics, which is very important in solution chemistry. Because if you have two uh, atoms reacting, the field of forces with the solvent molecule changes, and this has a very important role in the energy balance. So, uh, uh, so until uh, about uh, 10, 15 years ago, people were doing time-resolved femtosecond spectroscopy using visible light, visible UV. So basic, basically, you go from 400 to 700 nanometers. But, and, and the observable was where frequencies and intensities of optical transitions. As you all know, because of this wavelength, this you cannot resolve with visible light the uh, bond distance between two atoms. Uh, and these observables, which provide a lot of information, uh, cannot give you structure nevertheless. And unless you know the energy landscape of the system, and that is possible only in diatomic molecules. So you cannot really deduce the structural dynamics of the system, uh, except in the case of diatomics and maybe some triatomics. And in order to then see structures, you have to go to the short wavelength range to about one angstrom uh, uh, resolution. Uh, or you can use also uh, electrons, accelerated electrons, 50 to 100 keV, and you do electron diffraction. And Ahmed Zawail pioneered actually the field of electron, uh, femtosecond electron diffraction, and then he even brought it to a new level with uh, uh, ultrafast electron microscopy, and uh, he calls it 4D because you can see in the three uh, dimensions of space, in real space, not in Fourier space, and in the dimension of time. And so if you have a sample here, you have a, a, a heating pulse of a laser that starts some process in the system, and then you come with a time-delayed electron pulse, and you can look in uh, reflection at the diffraction <coughs> for different time scales. And he did absolutely <coughs> uh, amazing uh, uh, developments uh, with this method and um, amazing scientific breakthroughs, which I'm sure would have earned him uh, a second Nobel Prize had he not passed away, uh, unfortunately, too prematurely. So, um, what about X-rays? So, X-rays, uh, this is a picture, a cartoon from uh, the Life magazine of 1896, and you see how people were perceiving X-rays. So that's, uh, you know, it's, it's a peasant is being photographed and, and the guy is telling, the photographer is telling him, look pleasant, please. Uh, but x-rays uh, <coughs> uh, were not convincing everybody. Lord Kelvin said x-ray would, would be a hoax. Well, he, was, he couldn't be more wrong than that because right after the discovery of x-rays, the, the chain of discoveries uh, 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 leading to new methods was absolutely flabbergasting. Um, in 1911, I'm only writing the dates when these people got the Nobel Prize, uh, Charles Barclay got the Nobel Prize for uh, X-ray spectroscopy. Absorption spectroscopy, I did not realize this, was discovered before X-ray diffraction. X-ray absorption was discovered, so X-ray spectroscopy was in a very ingenious way by this man. And then you had the, the diffraction methods, the Debye-Scherer uh, scattering, and then back to spectroscopy. Uh, and then uh, nothing much happened until 1970 when Kai Siegban got, again, uh, the son of uh, Manne Siegban, got the Nobel Prize for the ESCA method, again, a spectroscopic method based on photoelectron spectroscopy. And X-ray spectroscopy, even though it was discovered before, was only very late used for structural determination because the analysis of the spectra was not clear. We had to wait 1974 till then, to be able to interpret X-ray absorption spectra, and I'll come to that in a second. Now, to do all these techniques in the X-rays, and especially if you want to do them in a time-resolved domain, you have to have uh, pulsed sources. When we started to develop uh, time-resolved X-ray spectroscopy, there were no femtosecond X-ray uh, sources, so we decided, okay, let's go where, where, wherever we can find them, and we had uh, um, a synchrotron, the Swiss light source and synchrotrons, as you know, are machines, uh, storage rings where you accelerate buckets of electrons at near velocity of light, and every time they are deflected by a magnet, they emit electromagnetic radiation, and this electromagnetic radiation has some very interesting properties like tunability, a pulsed character, and uh, a certain flux. 
Now, the point about the synchrotrons is because of the physics of the storage ring, you cannot get pulses smaller than 5200 picoseconds. Now, by the way, you, have, you mentioned the ALBA, you have ALBA in, in, in Barcelona. So, uh, this is still not uh, into the time domain of nuclear motion, but we decided to move on and use whatever we could do, and there is quite still a lot to do with this time resolution. Some years later, people could extract femtosecond duration pulses from synchrotrons by a scheme called the slicing scheme, which consists in co-propagating with, uh, uh, with the electron bunch, the cigar thing, uh, uh, an intense uh, femtosecond laser pulse, and you slice out two wedges, and then when they go through the insertion devices and all this, um, you get emission. But the problem with this technique is that if you slice out 100 picosecond pulse to 100 femtosecond pulse, you already have a drop of a thousand in the flux. So the flux is very weak. Nevertheless, we demonstrated the first X-ray spectroscopy experiment with this scheme, and that was quite a challenge then. Okay, nowadays this has been abandoned because uh, the free electron lasers have come into uh, uh, operation in 2010. The first uh, machine was LCLS in Stanford, and the second machine was Sakla in Japan. And if you look here somewhere, I think uh, uh, there's distance, yeah. Zero kilometers, two kilometers, three kilometers. So this is a typical length of these machines. What you do in these machines is you accelerate, these are former linear accelerators used for high energy physics. You accelerate the charged particles to a near velocity of light, and then they enter into this wiggler or undulator, which is a stack, an array of north-south uh, magnets, and they start wiggling. And in this wiggling motion, they emit light, synchrotron light. At the beginning, it's very chaotic, but then there is a coupling between the charged particles and the, fee the electromagnetic field, which leads to what people call micro-bunching, and that's re this ramps up the intensity to the point that you get a high flux at the exit, which you can use now for many applications, and these are really a, a game-changer. Um, two new machines uh, <coughs> are, have come in, into operation last year. I'm talking only about hard X-ray machines. Uh, one in Switzerland, the Swiss Fell, and the other in, uh, not, uh, and the other in Hamburg, the European XFEL, which is to date now the biggest machine because I think the Germans wanted to do something bigger than the Americans, so they have 3.5 kilometers long uh, of the machine. The Swiss, because the country is small, they have an 800 long machine. There are also soft X-ray free electron lasers, and one of them, which is extremely successful, is the one uh, in Trieste in Italy, Fermi. And there is another one also in Hamburg. Now, <clears throat> to give you an order of magnitude of the gain you have with free electron lasers, this is a flux, so this is a pulse intensity, the number of photons per pulse that you get at the synchrotron, and as I said, you are limited to about 5200 picosecond pulse width, and you see that you don't get really much, much way above 10 to the power 6 photons per pulse. If you go to the slicing, you drop to about 10 to 100 photons per pulse. It's really a killer to do experiments with this. <clears throat> you can have lab-based sources, but they're not uh, tunable. Uh, and look at the jump that you get with a free electron laser. For the same width of about 50 to 100 femtoseconds, you have 11 orders of magnitude to 10 orders of magnitude jump in flux. So you understand why this is such a game changer. Now, what can you do with these machines, or what can you do in general with pulsed X-rays? Uh, you can do uh, uh, ultra-fast X-ray diffraction, so you have a crystal, you have an X-ray pulse. If you have no excitation, you can get a nice, uh, the nice black spots. But now if you perturb at time zero, that means when the two pulses arrive together, the crystal, at the beginning you see nothing, and then uh, depending on what process you trigger, you could have coherent phonons, you will see these black spots oscillate, or you could have a melting of your crystal and then you see them blur away and eventually you can follow recrystallization. Um, and, um, but, but for time-resolved X-ray diffraction, which, which we have used, by the way, uh, you need crystals or highly concentrated media. And it's not really element-specific. You don't have, you know, really the information about which elements are doing what. Or you can have it, but in an indirect fashion. Now, if you want to go to chemistry, chemistry is in solutions or in heterogeneous media, and therefore you need a technique that allows you to look at disordered media or, and, and heterogeneous media. 
And X-ray uh, scattering or X-ray diffraction is not really ideal in that case. So some years ago, we focused on X-ray spectroscopy. And um, there is a whole bunch of core level spectroscopies that are possible. The, the most straightforward one is you come with a tunable uh, X-ray pulse and you tune across the ionization limit and you extract a, 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 an electron from a, a shell and that produces a, a photoelectron and I will explain to you how you can get electronic structure information but also the local geometry around the absorbing atom. And this is of course element specific because these are edges, these are transitions that are specific to a given element. Once you have uh, created a hole in the K-shell, you can have refilling of this hole and you get X-ray emission, K-alpha, K-beta. This gives you again electronic structure information but it's also very sensitive to the spin state. It's one of the best markers of the spin state of a system. And the third thing is to exploit the kinetic energy of the photoelectron you've produced and measure it and that gives you the absolute binding energies and also the chemical bond. So these techniques have given birth to lots of acronyms, you know, XANES, uh, XAFs, XAFs, whatever, you know, you don't want to tell this in presence of children. You know, it's, it's very, very swear, rude words. So, uh, what about X-ray absorption spectroscopy? I'll focus on that. You all remember from your uh, undergraduate textbooks that a typical X-ray absorption spectrum looks like that. You have a background due to Thomson scattering and then you have these edges which, is due, which are due to the fact that you are reaching the ionization threshold associated to this shell or to the L1 shell or L2 shell or L3 shell. By the way, does anyone know why, why people use this nomenclature, KLM? It's a very interesting story. The person who discovered that I said uh, X-ray spectroscopy was Charles Barkla in 1905-1904. And he used a very ingenious method using filters because there was no way of dispersing the light. And then he found two edges. So he wanted to label them and he decided to take the BA of his name. And then he had a somewhat a visionary uh, doubt. He said, well, what if other edges are discovered? So then he took the KL. And that's how we ended up with this weird nomenclature, <laughs> KLMN. <laughs> anyway, if you zoom into one of these edges and provided the atom is embedded in a, in a molecule, you will see that there are lots of details, uh, modulations before the edge, uh, at, the, at the edge, above the edge. The edge, by the way, is in, in the language of solid state physics is a Fermi level. In the language of a molecule, it would be the ionization limit. Now, how do we explain these modulations? If you take the atom isolated and you have the Coulomb potential of the atom and you extract a call, uh, an electron from a core level, you tune across the ionization limit. If you have empty valence orbitals and if the transition is allowed by atomic selection rules, you might get bound-bound transitions just before the ionization threshold. So these are below the ionization. And then as you cross into the ionization, then you have an edge jump and then a flat background. And that means in this region, you are producing a photoelectron. And the de Broglie wavelength of the photoelectron is given by the excess energy above the ionization limit. And it scales as uh, the inverse uh, root square. Now, <clears throat> as soon as this atom has a neighbor, then you have, uh, this is well described by quantum mechanics, uh, quantum mechanical interference of the photoelectron wave with this well and you will have an outgoing and backscattered wave that interfere and the interference is going to modulate the uh, absorption cross-section. Now you can, you can look at it uh, pictorially in this way where you have an outgoing photoelectron wave, a backscattered photoelectron wave like the waves in a pond of water and the outgoing and backscattered waves uh, mo uh, interfere and give rise to these modulations. Now it's easy to understand that if you do, for example, you perturb the system by a chemical reaction or a photo-induced process and you change the bond distances between these two atoms, then the interference pattern is going to change and therefore the modulations. In a nutshell, you, you subtract this uh, free atom background, uh, you end up with a spectrum which is in energy, which you convert into wave vector, a proportional and the Fourier transform of wave vector is angstroms and therefore you get the local topology around the atom. Okay, this is really very crudely said. So these are the reasons why we went to X-ray spectroscopy. You can apply it to any medium. 
uh, you are element specific, you get the electronic structure because you can see these transitions. By the way, these are valence uh, orbitals. And if you do something to the system, you read off directly in the spectrum what has happened via these transitions. So they're very useful. Density of state, oxidation state, and so on. And then you can get the bond distances and angles. Now the big difference with X-ray diffraction is it's a very local uh, probe of the structure. You can only look at uh, what is around the atom that is absorbing the X-ray, and maybe one shell or two shells, but not beyond. And that's a big difference with the X-ray diffraction, which gives you the global structure. However, if you're interested in short time scales, then uh, short length scales are fine. So we're in good shape. OK, the way we do the experiment is like in all the pump probe experiments. Uh, you, you go to a synchrotron, you excite, you excite uh, your sample. It could be a recirculating jet with a short laser pulse. And then you probe it with a time delayed probe pulse. And uh, the, we take basically the difference between the excited minus unexcited sample transmission. And, and that's basically the, the observable. Um, and that's more or less the same as you do with all pump probe techniques, except that here the, the probe pulse is the X-ray pulse. So one of the <coughs> first systems we focused on, and with which we demonstrated the femtosecond version of X-ray spectroscopy, was, was this uh, family of molecules called iron polypyridine uh, molecules. They are very important for uh, uh, um, uh, spin dynamics because they can go uh, uh, from a low spin to a high spin state, um, either by temperature, pressure, or light. This molecule in particular can only be triggered to the high spin by light. And these processes where you go from a low spin to a high spin state are very important for optical writing, magnetic reading of data storage. In biology, by the way, when you breathe and you go from uh, the dome, to the planar to the dome porphyrin, the dome porphyrin in our hemoglobin is a high spin iron complex, very similar to that one, whereas the planar is a low spin. And actually it's the same spin change. Uh, for solar energy conversion and uh, by stability of magnetic uh, molecules, this is also a very uh, hot topic. So when we started, we, we, we were interested in understanding the, the structure change upon crossover because you are going from a low spin with only bonding orbitals to two electrons in the anti-bonding orbital. And then what are the mechanisms for the spin crossover and the time scales? I don't want to go too much into details. These are both... Um, uh, 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 picosecond, so the red and femtosecond uh, transient absorption spectra. These are the spectra before excitation and the spectrum you recover after excitation. This paper was really uh, the, the first that showed that the uh, high spin state is reached on extremely short time scales, which is very unusual for molecules. Uh, and then we uh, found observables also in the deep UV range, and we could show that the low spin to high spin uh, state uh, goes uh, in about 50 femtoseconds, which is diabolically fast. And then uh, the group of Kelly Gaffney implemented uh, X-ray emission probes. So you excite the system with a laser pulse and you probe with a, a, a pulse from the free electron laser and you record the X-ray emission at each time delay. Here you see the, the sensitivity of uh, the K-beta emission to the spin state of the system. These are model compounds from singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet, quintet. And you see how the changes go. And they use these as, uh, if you want, ben benchmarks to get the, the, the transients. These are difference between excited minus and excited X-ray emission. So that shows you the variety of, um, of, of tools you can apply to, to nail down the spin changes. And uh, one of the very remarkable um, finding was that the spin change takes place in less than 50 femtoseconds. Delta S equals 2. This is very unusual. Um, and it takes place on the time scale of the Fe uh, nitrogen bond vibrations, which are basically, <coughs> which, which tells you that basically nuclear spin and structural dynamics are very strongly coupled and they are concurrently taking place. And this is a fairly general pattern, and, and porphyrins in biology are doing exactly the same thing. Okay, then uh, we looked at um, uh, solar materials. You know that uh, nowadays there's very hot uh, activity around solar materials, transition metal oxides, and other materials like perovskites. 
the whole uh, uh, excitement started uh, in the early 70s when uh, uh, using titanium dioxide, uh, Fujishima and Honda saw that they could split water by irradiating nanoparticles of titanium dioxide. Uh, the, the, and, and for photocatalysis, basically you create electron and holes, they migrate to the surface and they can take place, uh, they can take part in oxidation or reduction uh, reactions. Um, for, this pro for this process, you want charges at the surface and you want them to be trapped for a long time. Uh, whereas uh, um, the problem in this application is that the gap in these materials is too large for the solar spectrum. And therefore, my colleague at uh, the PFL, Michael Gretzel, had the idea of anchoring uh, uh, antenna molecules, which are ruthenium complexes, that capture the light and inject an electron. And then if you put a difference potential, you can get current. And this is the basis of the disensitized solar cells, which are also called Gretzel cells, for photovoltaics. And the requirement in this case is you want long range transport and high mobility. So there, these uh, applications are quite uh, uh, opposing each other. So there were many studies done with um, infrared, visible uh, terahertz probes of the charge carrier dynamics uh, in these systems. But, but uh, when you're doing probes in these wavelengths, what you see are free charges in the conduction band. And these free charges are not specific to the material. Any material would have free charges. I mean, a metal or a semiconductor that you, you put in, you excite to the conduction band will have ch free charges. And these free charges are described by the Druder model. What we wanted is to see what happens to the charger with element selectivity. So we did experiments with both bare and disensitized uh, uh, titanium dioxide nanoparticles, where we probed the ruthenium atom in the sensitizer with X-rays and the titanium atoms also with X-rays in the substrate. And uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this. These are the type of transients you get for the bare, for the disensitized. Cut long story short, what we see is that the titanium atoms get reduced, that there is an enhancement of these bound-bound atomic transitions. So this is telling you something about changes in the symmetry because these are, one is 3D formally forbidden transitions, but here they get enhanced, so you have a change in, in, uh, in, in, in symmetry. So uh, just to summarize these, uh, these uh, uh, transients for the bare and the disensitized, what happens here is that when you excite the bare nanoparticles, you create these electron hole uh, char uh, charges that go and migrate and get trapped in the deep uh, uh, shell of the uh, nanoparticles. These shells have defective, uh, uh, um, uh, these nanoparticles have defective shells and rather crystalline cores, and that's normal because it's a nanoparticle, so you have truncation effects, you have all sorts of things happening at the surface. And we could also interpret these data for the disensitized in the fact that when you inject the electron from outside, then it gets really trapped on the outer surface. And we could even demonstrate that these are pentacoordinated defects. I mean, we analyzed all these data, actually. The red dashed uh, curve is the analysis. Um, and, um, uh, and we also found similar results for other polymorphs of uh, TiO2. So this was done with picosecond uh, time resolution. Uh, it, doesn't, it tells us what is the nature of the uh, trapping sites, but it doesn't tell us how fast the trapping takes place. And we did probably the last experiment that was ever done on the slicing scheme. As I told you, this was done with 10 photons per pulse. Uh, and uh, we, we looked at the trapping time of the um, uh, electron in these defects. You see the error bars are large because the count rate is extremely low. It took us a week to record this, just a week. And then um, <clears throat> what this says basically is that in less than 200 femtoseconds, you have the electron that gets trapped at these pentacoordinated defects, where the blue do dots are the titanium and the red ones are the oxygen. And then um, immediately afterwards, uh, a group in Japan picked up our results and did an experiment with a free electron laser and you will be struck by the difference in quality in, in signal to noise. And they could tune in the spectrum to features that are purely electronic or purely structural and there they saw a different rise time, which makes sense. 
Electronic structure changes are immediate, probably less than 100 femtoseconds. But then the structural dynamics of these oxygens to move away from the titanium takes time, and you see that the time scale for, structural, for the structural response is three times that of the, um, of the uh, electronic response. Okay, again, we did uh, recently work on zinc oxide where we found the trapping of holes this time at oxygen vacancies, and I don't want to go too much into detail. Uh, this just appeared uh, a couple of weeks ago. Okay, uh, with this, sorry, with this I, I, I just gave you uh, a flavor about what type of uh, studies we did. Uh, we have many other results, for example, on proteins, where we looked at the dissociation of the uh, ligand from, uh, from the porphyrin and the heme, and you look at the recombination, how fast it takes place. We did first picosecond experiments here, and we have recently done experiments with a free electron laser, both in Hamburg and in Japan. Uh, we looked at perovskites by tuning to each atom, so you have element selectivity. We observed the response of the lead, of the halogen, and the cesium atoms. Uh, we looked at solvation dynamics by taking uh, uh, atomic solutes and uh, changing the electronic structure of the solute by, in this case, iodide, transforming it into neutral iodine and looking at the response of the uh, solvation shell, which is quite dramatic. Um, and we have also done uh, reaction dynamics in solution uh, between molecules and solvent uh, species. This is, uh, in, in a very brief way, the, uh, the, 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 the results we have. We have. I didn't mention everything, but I want to stress now that the, uh, these time-resolved core level spectroscopies are gaining momentum. Uh, there are many, many different techniques, as I said, with different acronyms. Resonant inelastic X-ray scattering is a type of X-ray Raman technique which is extremely powerful, especially for ordered solids when you're doing uh, condensed matter physics because you can uh, resolve in momentum space and if you do it in a time-resolved fashion you can also get the time evolution of the system. The first paper was published uh, a year ago and it was uh, um, uh, results from the free electron laser in, uh, in Stanford. I mentioned X-ray absorption. We have results on X-ray uh, resonant emission. I did not mention uh, photoelectron spectroscopy of liquids, which is by no means trivial because you have to detect electrons and you have to inject them. Uh, so you need vacuum, and your uh, uh, liquid is, in, is under vacuum. But we manage now to get uh, results on this. Angle resolved photoemission is another very powerful tool used by condensed matter physicists, and it's basically the, the sister of uh, RICS. Uh, and so on, and, and all the domains that are now expanding uh, thanks to the arrival of free electron lasers is just amazing. Now, I want to say that uh, the results I showed you briefly um, wouldn't have been obtained only with these techniques. In fact, you have to combine also time-resolved optical domain spectroscopies, uh, whether trans uh, absorption or fluorescence, with all these core-level techniques in order to get the full picture. And that, uh, with this, I, I, this reminds me of this, uh, 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 this uh, legend of the blind man and the, and the elephant, uh, which comes from the East, uh, where you have six blind men touching an elephant, and each one says, this is a rope, this is a wall, this is a pillar, this is a, a pipe, whatever, you know. Each one is touching and is completely wrong. You know, each one has his own experience that can be true, but if you want to really get the full picture, you have to combine them together. Okay, with this... I'd like to thank uh, the, uh, members of my team. In red are those who have left the group after surviving. Uh, many collaborations of all sorts, theoreticians and people providing us with samples and funding agencies and you for your attention. <laughs>